when we're talking about the heart, I try every time that I'm preparing to present and communicate, I, I would say 99% of the time I pray something like this, Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew in me a right spirit. Hi there. Welcome back to the Christian Leader Made Simple podcast. I am Ryan Franklin, and I would love for you to join me every week as we explore leadership topics that will help you get the clarity needed to move your church or your organization forward. You can hit the subscribe button and the bell to get notified as soon as I post a new session. And before we get started, I do want to mention that I have a great product called the Christian Leader Blueprint. It's a solid model for leadership development to help you establish a better rhythm of life, to see yourself more clearly, to leverage your strengths, and to build more productive relationships. And I want to give it to you as my free gift. You can go to ryanfranklin.org and you can download the short guide for free today. And without any further delay, let's get to our session. I'm thrilled to have on the podcast a highly respected leader in my life, Reverend Stan Gleason. He is the Assistant General Superintendent of the UPCI. And since 1989, if I have that correctly, he has been the senior pastor of the Life Church in Kansas City, which has thrived and has experienced tremendous growth under his leadership for many years. And he is a well educated man with uh, multiple degrees. And I would say more accolades than I could even list here. Um, But I would say that his most important accomplishment that has really stood out in my mind and that he has example to me is that he is a dedicated and a successful husband and father. And really, he is a mentor. Uh, I hear his name all over the place from many, many people because he's a mentor to many young and even older ministers across our our nation. And one of the things that I really love about Brother Gleason is that he is so kind and he is so approachable, even through even though his accomplishments are, are so great. And I met Brother Gleason back in 2010 on an Israel trip. And I was a young minister. I was trying to find my way in life and in ministry, and I specifically remember him slowing down, and he was looking me in the eye and truly caring about me as a person on that trip, and I never forgot that, and it made him one of probably the most respected men in my life for for the years following, even to today. And Brother Gleason, thank you for, for taking interest in me, particularly at that early age, but but then thank you so much for taking your valuable time. I know you're a very busy man, but thank you for taking your valuable time to be on the Christian Leader Made Simple podcast. So with that said, I, I say welcome. Thank you, Ryan, for the kind introduction. Thank you for all those nice things you said about me. I think you uh, made me a lot better than I really am, but uh, I at the risk of sounding like the mutual admiration society here. I do respect you. Um, I thank God for you, your life. uh, From the day we met somewhere on the Sea of Galilee, um, with all the nice things you said about me, I was not walking on the water. Uh, But uh, we, uh, yeah, we made a lifelong, a future lifelong connection on that trip and uh, I've admired you. I look forward to connecting with you when I come to UPCI Mecca in Alexandria, Louisiana in January, which we will do in a few days uh, for Because of the Times, which has made a difference. So we're proud of you and your role there um, on the pastoral team, and you're making a difference. And so thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. Well, thank you. Thank you for those kind words. And today, we've got a very specific subject that, we, that uh, we've agreed to dive into. 
And I, I want to unpack a portion of a book that you published, I think, in the middle of, of 2022. And I have to be honest with you. Somehow I missed that you wrote this book. Um, I was not aware of it. I don't know how I missed that because I, I get all the emails and things of that nature. But uh, the book is called The Unflawed Leader, Creating a Culture of Christlike Wellness in the Local Church. And uh, and since I found out about it, I am all caught up with, with reading it. And I, I have to say it is a phenomenal book. And and some concepts within that book um, were were really enlightening to me. And, and, and I was so excited that you were even speaking on some of those things. And, uh, and I realized that many times a book like this is not just written, it's sort of birthed in some way, and uh, maybe even over a lifetime of, of life. And so can you talk a little bit about what inspired you to write this book? So um, you're right that The Unflawed Leader is a lifelong story. For me, in fact, uh, as I was writing the book, probably during COVID and coming out of COVID, um, I told my wife I was writing a book. She said, oh, what's the name of it? I said, The Unflawed Leader. She said, oh, an autobiography? <laughs> no, she didn't. <laughs> my, my wife knows me better than anybody. She would never, never accuse me of that. So uh, The Unflawed Leader can only be about one man in all of human history, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And uh, I've, of course, he's our Lord. He's our Savior. I love Jesus. But we don't usually think of Jesus as a leader. We mm -hmm. typically think of him as Messiah, Savior, Healer, Deliverer, Waymaker, soon coming King. But if you don't think Jesus was not the best leader, the greatest leader the world has ever seen, you don't know the Jesus that I know, and you have not studied the Jesus of the Bible. And so, uh, you know, he invented the church, he created the church, he envisioned the church, he purchased the church. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. And so this book is a pushback against flawed leadership in the church. We are flawed. We have all seen flawed leadership. But I think church leadership deserves a reexamination of the leadership of Jesus Christ. How did he treat people? How did he talk to people? How did he manage difficult people? Uh, and so he brings no habits, hurts, hang-ups, unmet emotional issues, baggage, dysfunction, insecurities, all the things that we bring. Yeah. He does not bring any of that to his leadership context, and so I thought it was worth an examination. Yeah. Well, I have to admit, at, at first glance, I, I sort of, laughed at the title because I, I've, I've worked for years, Brother Gleason, at, try, at giving up trying to be uh, unflawed, and here you are writing a book called The Unflawed Leader, and then I, then I as I got into it and, and even read the subtitle even, you know, I realized that the book is about Jesus, and uh, in this process of writing, um, were, were there anything that you really I know there's lots of things you learned and wrote about in the book, but was there anything that you learned about yourself while you were writing this book? What surprised you the most as you were diving into these things in your life? Probably the fact that I still have a long way to go to be like the Lord, as the old song says. I can't yeah. say that anything surprised me because I am what I would consider to be a pretty self-aware uh, person. I think I understand my strengths, my weaknesses. I've made a lot of mistakes as a husband, a father, a pastor, organizational leader. 
Um, and I try to learn from those. Uh, but I still just try to follow Jesus. And, you know, back in the 90s, there was this WWJD, what would Jesus do? And to be sure, that's, you know, that was marketable. It was bumper stickers, T-shirts, umbrellas, you know, skateboards. It was everywhere. But I think to balance that, we have to also understand what would Jesus not do? Mm -hmm. If he did it, do it. If he didn't do it, don't do it. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I hope I'm approaching the answer to the question. But I wouldn't say I, I discovered anything about myself that surprised me because, as I said at the beginning, this this book is 40 years of observations. It's highly anecdotal. It's not a one, two, three leadership book. Mm -mm. It's more of a uh, big idea, conceptual you know, take another look at Jesus and let's reach for him. Yeah. And it's full of nuggets. Um, it's uh, so many that we pro that I know that there's no way that we could get to them all that stood out to me. But there was a few particular that uh, that really stood out to me. And, and if you would be okay with it, I, I think it would be a good idea to just... Uh, maybe let me read a couple of these nuggets and then we dialogue about them. That'd be great. If that's okay with you. There's, uh, there's really, like I say, there's so much in this book that, that we could talk about. Um, so I, I want to zero in on two particular chapters, um, really the introduction and, and two chapters, chapter one and chapter six, uh, if we have time to get to chapter six and, and uh, we'll just encourage the listener to uh, go and purchase this book and dive into the rest of it uh, because it's all phenomenal. I mean, it's full of really solid stuff, really good nuggets um, and challenges. And, and, um, and so let's just take some of these nuggets that I found in the book and, and sort of expound on them. So I'll start off with this one. Um, and I copied and pasted this uh, from your Kindle version of your book word for word. So here it is. Uh, an Old Testament priestly garment would cost $10,000 to recreate today. But the man who wore it in the tabernacle was commanded by God to walk in bare feet. This was a reminder by God to his representative that he was a flawed man. And at the end of the day, when he hung up his regal robes, there would be dirt between his toes. So Unpack that with us, Brother Gleason, and, and tell us more about that. that. That was an interesting quote, and I think a good one to get us started. So I think what I'm trying to say there is um, every leader has blind spots. Um, okay. And my pastor taught me that if God ever uses you in some unique, special, even spectacular, supernatural way, great or small, when you get al when you're alone after the applause dies down and the moment is over he said go stick your head under a chair and remind yourself that you're an unprofitable servant hmm. i never forgot that and i think the priestly robe barefoot uh example is a reminder to every leader that we are not invincible we are not perfect. We should be uh, correctable. Mm -hmm. We should have, you know, David, you know, just took off and did what he wanted to do, and then it took the prophet to come and say, you are the man. And uh, at the end of the day, we have to be saved. We have to be saved. And, and so, uh, you know, Ryan... Uh, there's a statement that I make to our church occasionally. I've been here 35 years. I've probably made it 20 times. And those have been with me all these years. They, they will know that I've said it. And it is this. Don't look too closely at me because you're sure to discover something 
that will disappoint you. And to me, that is a statement of secure in who I am. Uh, I don't have any really deep, dark secret to hide. Yeah. I don't have any deep, dark sin that's, you know, glaring. And, you know, I'm all over social media. I'm on YouTube. I'm, you know, today's culture. People can find whatever they want to find. But if you look close enough, you'll find the dirt between my toes. You know, maybe I eat too much ice cream. You know, I mean, you know, if I play <laughs> 20 rounds. too much. Yeah. <laughs> If I played 20 rounds of golf in the golf season here in Kansas City between April and November, you know, maybe you think that's too much golf. Um, you know, I don't know. You'll you'll find something you don't like. But I'm okay with that because I'm flawed. And neither am I saying, well, I'm not perfect, so deal with it. You know, that's not my attitude. But uh, we have to keep this. This is sort of a balancing uh, mm -hmm. metaphor for all of us. So you said every, every leader has blind spots. That was actually my next quote that I, that I pulled from the book. Every leader has blind spots, but then you said discovering them is an eye opener. And you mentioned, uh, you mentioned that you're very self-aware. You're, you're probably intently aware of your blind spots but there's a lot of leaders out there that are not, you know, everybody else around them sees the flaws and the dirt between their toes. But for some reason, we as leaders, and I, and I put myself in that, um, have trouble seeing that dirt between our toes. And so just to add, out of curiosity, uh, I, I know that that came from a particular place in, in your mind and heart in dealing with pastors and church leaders. What are the more common blind spots that you have seen in pastors and church leaders that that maybe people are just not aware of and and what do you uh what have you found to be the best way of dis sort of discovering those things for an individual to discover those things yeah well if you're married it's obvious that the best discover of your blind spots <laughs> would be a godly prayerful humble but well-spoken wife who can you know as God has given me, you know, my wife's a prophetess. She's prophetic, so I can't get away with anything. <laughs> uh, and I thank God for her. Her prayers for me for the 44 years of our marriage have blessed me. And so I do thank God for Marlene. She's got her feet flat on the floor. She's a very no-nonsense, common-sense, uh, mm -hmm. prophetic counterpart and I thank God for her I think maybe there's probably more than you know obviously one or two but I would say the things that jump out to me most would be uh, sometimes leaders make mental jumps they they make assumptions uh, assuming uh, that um, because I see it, everybody sees it. Because I want to do it, everybody wants to do it. Because I feel it, you know, everybody should feel it. And I'm going to give you an illustration, a personal story. I don't think this is in the book, but um, when I was district superintendent here in Missouri from 2002 to 2010, there had been a conversation in our district informally about building a 3,000 seat auditorium on our campus, which included Gateway College and the mm -hmm. Urshan, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the Missouri District offices. And so we had like 23 acres there and uh, it seemed like a, a good idea. Lots of people had talked about, it. I've heard about it ever since I've been in the district. So I talked to our district secretary, Brother Williford. I talked to some of our key leaders, including Tim Dugas, who at that time was the president of Gateway College, and some of our presbyters. I took it to a board meeting. We discussed it thoroughly. The board was all in 100%. Uh, I took it to 11 sectional conferences uh, on my annual trip around the district with Brother Williford 
conducting sectional conferences. We actually put out an anonymous survey. We gave it out while we were there. They could sign their name if they wanted to, but they didn't have to. We asked some questions. It was going to be a $3 million building. Mm -hmm. And uh, when so it was like green lights all the way. When we got to district conference, it it, it crashed and burned. To this day, I'm really not sure what happened. But to me, that was a big eye-opener. You know, not everybody's as excited about your idea as you are. And Great people point. are excited about their ideas. You know, I thought I gave ownership. I thought I empowered. I thought I, you know, circled the bases and dotted the I's and crossed the T's. But apparently I didn't. So that was a big lesson to me. Don't assume that it's going to go. Uh, there's, you know, you may be overlooking something. And I don't, to this day, I don't know what the blind spot was on that. But it was big because it crashed big time. <laughs> it crashed big time. That's a, that's a great example. So moving on to the next, uh, mo moving on to the next nugget. Um, while it is true that without a vision, the people perish, it's also true that without a supporting culture, the vision will perish. Culture feeds on vision. Vision tells you where you want to go, but culture takes you there. Now, I, I realize that this this book is not all about culture, but you and I both know the leader creates that culture. So tell us, unpack that a little bit and tell us more about that. Yeah, so let's talk about a local church setting because that's my world um, and what I know the most about. But it's really true in any uh, dynamic where there are people. Mm -hmm. And that is that the leader is the culture. So in a church setting, the pastor is the culture. Uh, and that's a terrifying thing, at least it should be, to pastors. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been Especially here when you don't know your blind spots. Oh. And... <laughs> so I've been here 35 years, and um, I can't blame any church problems on my predecessors or on my staff. Mm -hmm. I have to, I can't be finger pointing. I have to look inside. What did I do? What have I been doing that has created this problem? Now, there's, it's one thing to have people with problems in the church, but it's a whole other thing to have church problems. People with yeah. trouble is one thing, but church trouble is another thing. Right. And, uh, you know, that statement got me in trouble a few years ago. You know, if you've been at a church for three or four years and you have church trouble, uh, that you can't pass the buck to anybody else but yourself. And I really believe that. We have to take ownership because we are the culture. And um, so, uh, yes, uh, you know, a pastor can get up, a visionary leader can get up and cast vision for the next year. But if the culture does not support the vision, then it's dead in the water. You know, That's good. I, yeah. I, I feature myself as a pretty good communicator, but I can't get up in January like I did last Sunday and preach our vision, which is building a daily New Testament church. That's our vision for 2023. But if we are not a daily church, if we don't strive to become a daily church, you know, that's just smoke and mirrors. That's just blowing smoke. That's not going to change anybody's life. We're not going to get to our goal of multiplication, so we have to have yeah. a, we have to build that culture. And uh, if if I could just add, how do you build culture? Well, obviously the pastor has to create the vision. Secondly, he has to model the behavior that he wants to see reproduced in others, because people don't do what we say; they do what they see. And so we cast the vision, we model the behavior. Thirdly, we have to put an expectation on our key leaders, our pastoral staff, our leadership team. 
and we have to put the demand on them to embrace the vision. Talk about it with their teams, embrace it, model it, do it. When you get that, when you know, it's one thing that the pastor's saying the vision, but when you have 12 or 15 leaders in the church, they're saying the vision and they're modeling the vision. Now you got something. And then we have to tell the stories of the people that are embraced, who have embraced the vision and are seeing the success of it unfold in their life. Yeah. My mind goes to, and I, and I realize that this is probably something we could spend the, the entire hour speaking about. So, but, but briefly, what do you feel are the, are the most important parts of a culture to a church leader, to a senior pastor even, um, to moving towards a specific vision? What do you feel are the most important parts? Well, um, first of all, there has to be the vision. Secondly, um, say Actually it. casting a vision. Yeah, casting the yeah. vision. But vision leaks, right? Right. So uh, you have to come back to it, I would say, every 30 days if you're really serious about it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'm – one of my weaknesses is, you know, I, I do have ideas. God does speak to me. And I'm going to tell you something. If God speaks to me, I am not holding it back. I'm putting it on a banner. Yeah. <laughs> one time the Lord spoke to me when our church – we had about 125 in our church, and I was praying one morning. The Lord spoke to me, I give you permission for 250. I wasn't expecting hmm. that. I was That just came out of nowhere. But I knew God spoke to me. So I went to Fast Sign. I got a maroon banner with yellow letters, you know, two feet high, permission 250. And I hung it above the pulpit. <laughs> and so the church is coming in looking at me like a cow at a new gate. You know, what? what is this about? And, you know, I, you know, my thing is if God speaks, I can go a long time on one word from God. Yeah. But my weakness is, so that maybe is a strength, but my weakness is, you know, to keep saying that continually, creatively, and mm -hmm. clearly. Communication. And yes. Yeah. yeah. It ha the vision has to be stated continually, creatively, and uh, consistently. And so all of these are aspects that create. But I think the biggest thing that creates culture, the desired culture, is when the people have their own stories. It's one thing for me to tell my stories. But when you start sharing the stories of the people in the congregation— yeah, uh, that's that's when it that's when you know you've got something special. It hits home for them in a in a different way. So we we've got the aspect of of spirituality and uh, you know I would imagine that most of pastors would understand I've got to I've got to hear from God and I've got to obey God's voice and et cetera. Um, and, and I realize that that ultimately impacts the heart in a great way. But this next nugget, the, the heart ultimately reveals what inspires and regulates leaders and how their interaction with those they lead is present. Kind of unpack that with us a little bit. So someone said your attitude is like your breath. Never assume it's good. <laughs> Paul said in Philippians 2 5, let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And this is what theologians call the kenosis passage, where Jesus, as God, empties himself of all his prerogatives, and he becomes like us, and he lives in our flawed world as the unflawed leader. Mm -hmm. And uh, so. I think when we're talking about the heart, I try every time that I'm preparing to present and communicate, I, I would say 99% of the time I pray something like this, Lord, create in me a clean heart. 
and renew in me a right spirit. Because James Kilgore was probably the greatest heart preacher I ever heard. And I remember him saying one time, if my words failed me as I was preaching, I always counted on my heart communicating to hearts. If I didn't have the right words, at least they could wow. hear my heart. That's and good. I, yes, and that, that makes me really emotional even right now, thinking about mm -hmm. him and his leadership and how he inspired me uh, from a distance. I never was close to Brother Kilgore, but I just loved his spirit. And I think as leaders, we have to guard our hearts because we don't minister in a vacuum. We don't preach, you know, we're not Walmart, we're not Target, we're not IBM. We're the apostolic church. This is a spirit-filled church. We're yeah. connected in the spirit. And our spirit communicates more than the words that we say. Hmm. Um, and so my heart is very important to me. My attitude is very important to me because... Yeah. I want to project the Spirit of Christ to the best of my ability, and I want our church to be the most loving church, the most positive church, the most, not fake positive, you know, uh, not that, but authentically, you know, an encouraging congregation, uh, and I think we have that because the pastor is the culture, and I'm trying to, you know, develop that in our congregation, so I think that's what I mean when I say you know, the heart communicates. Yeah, and, and that also leads into this next nugget that uh, very closely related. Um, it's, you said Paul said if, if we're speaking the truth in love, speaking the truth in love, then we're fostering a, a culture conducive to developing full spiritual maturity, which should be every church leader's ultimate goal. Speaking truth in love. Flesh that out a little bit. So this is a communication device that will bring a tremendous return to you or me or anyone that uses it, mm -hmm. um, both on a corporate level, a team level, a personal level, a marriage level, a parenting level, because... You know, just because it's the truth, it doesn't give you permission to kill people with it. The Bible says right. the law, the letter killeth, but the spirit gives life. And, you know, I've heard people say, well, by God, I gave them Acts 238. And if they want to split hell wide open by not obeying it, that's up to them. <laughs> well, that that sounds really spiritual, but really that's arrogant. That's really just arrogance. You know, that, that's a low EQ. That's a low EQ person. Their emotional intelligence is very, very low. So when we speak the truth, the truth hurts. It can hurt. It can. The truth can make free. The Bible says that. Only the truth shall make you free, set you free. And the Bible says that God desires truth in the inward parts. So when we have truth and we are truth and we embrace truth, not just theological truth, but relational truth and, you know, functional truth and behavioral truth, and we're authentic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can't stand fake. And I know it when I see it. I know it when I hear it. Um, but truth in the inward parts. When we have truth, when we are truth, we will speak truth. But let's speak it in love. In other words, we're not just going to take the grenade of truth out, pull the pin and whoosh, lob it over our head and blow people up with truth. Right. But uh, let's have a redemptive conclusion in mind to the speaking of truth. Does that make sense? You know, the 100%. goal is redemption. Yeah. The goal is 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 bringing people together, bringing the situation together. Uh, that I guess that's what I mean when I say and speak I, the truth in love. And I would say, Brother Gleason, that that's that is one extreme of of blasting someone with truth, and and the goal is to have truth in love.
But then there's another extreme of just love and not enough truth. And and it's sort of a middle ground is what I'm hearing hearing you say that we have to find in is speaking that truth in love. And I would say that there's there's quite a few people that would ha that would struggle with even giving truth. You know, people particularly and in a leadership setting in a local church, people, pastors who are high in compassion and love people, you know, it's hard to tell them the hard things that are going to move them forward and grow them. And and it would be important to have some sense of balance in that, would you say? I think that's a great point. You know, all love and no truth. You know, it's like, the Bible says, "Without a vision, the people perish." And mm -hmm. and that that the Hebrew language is idiomatic and it's rich in uh, imagery. And that would be like the image of a the banks of a river. Mm -hmm. The banks of a river, you know, the river can say, "Oh, I hate these banks. It makes me go, you know, somewhere that I don't want to go." But without the banks of the river, there would be no river. There would be no way to define a river. It'd be a swamp. But when you have banks in a river, it gives it power. It can be harnessed. It can be, it can be create energy. It can promote travel, and be a blessing. That's uh, good. And so, when we're saying you know all truth, and no love, we can blow people up. But if we're saying all love and no boundaries, then we don't have anything either. We're just a swamp. Uh, yeah. But when we have truth and love, it creates boundaries that are healthy for all of us and yeah. hopefully a good result. And I would say even in even in day to day communication and Matthew 18 -ing people, you know, having to confront things in <clears throat> excuse me, in leadership. You know, that's a, a, a huge principle that. Uh, you know, because of the, f from a psychology standpoint, when you, when you give someone the truth of, of where they're at and what you're seeing, maybe it's a blind spot in their life, but you do it in love, you're essentially killing the judge in that person. And, and I like to take the stance of, of even sandwiching truth between love. So, speak love you're killing the judge in them give them the truth in a very short form and then and then also uh and then follow that up with love as well so you're killing the judge on both ends of the truth and and it helps with insecure people or people that are not able to to take the truth in a in a healthy way it, it helps them walk away from the conversation um, in a much better way i love that the sandwich of truth and love so I just want to point out that is all, uh, everything that we just talked about is in the introduction of this book. <laughs> so we've got lots of chapters beyond the introduction. Uh, so there's, there's no way that we can get to it all, but I, I do want to uh, move into a couple more, uh, particularly in this chapter one, even the title of chapter one uh, kind of, it, 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 uh, it was an interesting title. Christ-like leaders must die. That's a that's an interesting chapter title. Can you explain more about that and where that came from? Yeah, Christ like leaders must die. Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really true. Um Jesus called us to come and die. He said, uh if you're going to follow me, you have to have a cross. Mm -hmm. If you don't want a cross, you can't follow me. You have to have one. A cross essentially is, you know, self-denial. And um, what I mean by Christ-like leaders must die, you got to have... So I believe that every apostolic, Pentecostal, oneness believer comes to a crisis in their faith. They will come to a crisis in their journey, sometimes more than once. I remember Billy Cole years ago, I think it was at Because of the Times, preaching about, he said, I tried 
to get out of the truth. I looked for every loophole. I doubted. I, I, I attacked. I confronted all of my fears, all of my doubts in the Bible. And he said, one by one, they were dispelled. One by one, they were taken away from me. One by one, my doubts went away. You know, you have to get honest about who you are and what you believe, particularly if people have been raised in the church and they've sort of been on someone's apron strings or coattails. They'll, their faith will come to a crisis. And um, if you've been taught right and you know what the Bible says, your crisis will never destroy you. Mm-hmm. It will only purify you. And the fire won't burn you up. It'll burn you better. Paul said that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he said, if you're built out of wood, hand, stubble, the fire will destroy you. But if you're, you built your life with gold, silver, and precious stones, it will only purify you. You know, trials don't make you what they are. They expose who you already are. Hmm. And wow. that's sort of an eye-opener. You know, when you go through stuff, you find out what you're made of. So I think when we say Christ-like leaders must die, we're not good to God, and we're not good. We can never help anybody else unless we've died, mm-hmm. unless we've been through pain, unless we've suffered. You know, I can listen to a young preacher, or any age preacher for that matter, five minutes, and I can tell if they've been through the fire or not. <laughs> and because if you've been in the fire, you identify with the others who have been through the fire with you. And some have been through the fire and didn't come out so well. They smell like smoke. Yeah. But uh, if you, uh, you know, sort of uh, synthesize your pain in prayer and humility before God, it never works against you. Hmm. It's always working for you. That's so good. Can you say that again? If you synthesize your pain in prayer, your problems will never destroy you. They will never work against you. For we know that all things work together for good to them who love the Lord, who are the called according to his purpose. On the basis of That's that powerful. scripture, I never, as a preacher, I never, uh, I never felt like any of my trials were a waste of time. I never felt like any of my battles were against me. I'm like, man, I'm like a fine wine. I I can't wait to taste me 30 days from now and see where (laughs) I'm at. You know, it's painful now, but when I come out, it's going to be better. So that's been my attitude. So speaking of pain and and you gave an example of of Brother Cole and and how he, you know, basically had to die. You in particular, uh, and this is your this is the next quote out of your book. You said during our nine month season between pastorates, I'm assuming this was the one right before the the life church. I came to to the end of myself, and for the first time in my life, I faced hopelessness. Was that your your death essentially, or one of them maybe? But that was that was maybe the most prominent death for you. What was that like for you? And uh, what words come to mind when you when you think back on that season, that emotional season of your life? Let me answer that part first. The words that come to my mind are despair, hopelessness. I quit. Mm-hmm. I'm turning in my license. I'm going to get an eight to five job. I'm going to. I had two small children. My wife and I are going to move to a good city where there's a good church. I'd already been 10 years in full-time ministry. Hmm. I'd evangelized twice. I was a youth pastor for three years. I was a lead pastor for five years. And that lead pastor for five years situation was a very, very difficult, very, very difficult time. Talk about culture. There was no revival culture. There was no growth culture. There was no disciple-making culture. It was a very staid, staunch, stable, uh, us four and no more, hold the fort uh, church. And I was 25 years old when I was unanimously elected by 41 voters. And that was the best vote 
I ever got, I think. Um, the first two, first three months we were there, we baptized 16. They hadn't baptized wow. anybody in two years. Wow. Prior to our arrival, and we hit the ground running, and God was so good. I thought everybody would be excited. Let's go. Boy, it hit the fan. And the power center kicked back, and that was essentially the issue. One thing I learned as a pastor is the problem is never the problem. There's always an underlying motivator that inspires the behavior. Yeah. And so uh, after, you know, once you, when you're in the battle, you fight and you do what you can. But when I resigned after five years, I really felt the Lord release me. Um, and very, I'm not patting myself on the back, but very few would have put up with what I put up with for so long. You know, I have the patience of Job up to a point, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My next book is, Lord, give me patience and give it to me now. Oh. <laughs> uh, so. Is that uh, really your next book? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so after I got out of the battle, um, my defenses were down, and it was really an attack of the enemy. A lot of self-doubt. Yeah. Uh, I started believing cool. some of my critics. And uh, so let me just tell you the one-minute version. It came to a crisis. I was mm -hmm. preaching a revival in Lone Oak, Arkansas for Brother Joe Strand. And I deadbolted myself in the evangelist quarters before Sunday night service. I could hear him practicing music and all that. And I was so angry. I was so frustrated. I was so upset. I was scared. I'm like, I am no preacher. What am I doing? I'm fooling myself. Just a lot of this attack. It was a spiritual attack. Wow. And I screamed at God. And I'm not advocating this. But I'll say this. If you're honest, you can be mad. But don't charge God foolishly. Hmm. And I did not do that. But I said, God, I know there's got to be something more than what I've got because I've got nothing. And I am not leaving this room until you give me the desire to do it. I screamed it. Wow. And when I said that, something broke inside of me. And I fell to the ground. I was weeping. I don't know. I don't know, probably 10, 15, 20 minutes, just sobbing. I think I was feeling sorry for myself. But then it shifted, and it became spiritual. Mm -hmm. And the Lord spoke to me right here, 1 Corinthians 10, 15. I didn't know what it said. Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Mm -hmm. I, I got my Bible out, and I'm weeping. I'm on the floor. I got my suit and tie on. I'm ready to preach. I'm on the floor. I'm paging through the Bible. I find it. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Then the Holy Ghost says, Philippians 2.13, It is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. My whole life, I thought I had to create this desire. But God revealed to me the source of my spiritual desire is the grace of God. It changed my life. You know, maybe everybody in your audience said, Oh, by God, I learned that when I was three years old. Well, good. <laughs> I didn't learn it till I was... Uh, 30, 31. <laughs> I was a late bloomer, but it changed my life, Ryan. I went, I'm a note preacher. I went out to that church that night with two scriptures, huh. 1 Corinthians 15, 10 and Philippians 2, 13. I preached the house down, the paint off the wall. They had to call in the painters the next day <laughs> to repaint the building. I mean, I climbed the pews. I cried. I shouted. I wept. I had a revelation. And here's what's awesome. At the end of the message, of course, God, I'm thankful God moved in. And I was sitting on the altar, <laughs> like catching my breath. I'm like, what has happened to me? And a prophetess came up to us. She laid her hands. My wife was sitting beside me. She's looking at me like, what happened to you? And she put her hands on our heads, and she said, God's going to give you direction for your ministry in three weeks. That was June the 5th, 1988. June 26th, 
three weeks to the day, I was preaching my first message at the Life Church. Wow. I mean, just just like that. The crisis was over. I had a revelation. I have never been the same since. The revelation was the grace of God at work in me, giving me the desire of what God wants me to do, and I've never been the same. It's amazing to hear, you know, you started that off, even in the quote, the, the, the emotion there is hopelessness. And then you gave three or four despair and three or four other uh, emotions that you were feeling. But the result of that was a, you were standing in a pulpit at a church that you would go on to pastor for, you know, 30 something years longer. And, and on and on the accolades of things that God has done in your life and through you. But it was, it started, it was a life changing, a death in a sense of hopelessness, of despair. Yes. And you responded to that in a, in a significant way. You responded to that, to that appropriately in the will of God. And it, and it took you to that place of standing in that pulpit. The verse for that, forward. Brian, the verse for that. You know, Jesus said, except a corn of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. And for Mm. me, my death was coming to the end of myself. I came to the end of my talent. I came to the end of my gifts. I came to the end of my pedigree. It it was for naught. It didn't mean anything unless it's touched and empowered by the grace of God. And Brother Gleason, in that moment, you didn't resist what God was doing. And and you said it took a long time for you to get to that place, so maybe you resisted earlier, I don't know. Uh, but you gave the story of in your book of you giving, uh, of uh, you needing blood pressure medicine at some point in that time. And you didn't know how bad you really felt until you started feeling better. And you then you look back and you realize, well, I, I really... I really needed to feel better. I was I was in a bad shape. But you said you said something that was pretty important. You said everybody senses something is wrong. But since they are functional and some some good things are happening, they feel no immediate cause for alarm. And I see that in my mind I'm seeing that as a sort of resistance of of coming to the to the to that death or that end of yourself. Can you explain that? A little bit more. Yeah, so I think at that part in the book, I'm trying to explain that when people are in a dysfunctional culture, Mm -hmm. let's say it's a dysfunctional marriage, let's say it's a dysfunctional family, or a work setting, or even, God forbid, a church dynamic, there can be enough good in a marriage that it outweighs what's wrong there can be enough good in a family that the family can survive even though there's severe let's say misbehavior uh, language abuse Mm -hmm. Uh, and it can happen in a congregation where uh, equipped informed spirit-filled members of the congregation uh, maybe something doesn't seem right. Maybe something seems a little bit off. But, you know, the church is growing. You know, things are okay. There's enough money. There's people. There's, you know, there's really no reason to abort ship, you know, abandon ship. But the analogy of the blood pressure medicine was uh, this was actually after that crisis Mm-hmm. Uh, about, I don't know, 10 years later, we were in a relocation. And uh, if there's anything that will raise the blood pressure of a pastor, it's a building program. <laughs> but high blood pressure runs in our family, so I was a candidate, building program or no building program. It certainly didn't help it. And so I was 43 or 4 years old, and, uh, boy, I was feeling bad. But it snuck up on me. I didn't realize it. And then finally, it my blood pressure was, let me think. For some people, they're thinking, man, that's not bad at all. It was like, I don't know, 140 over 95, I think it was. I didn't know anything about blood pressure. 
I wouldn't even taken physicals in those days, you know, in my middle 40s. Who needs them? That's for old people like me now. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I was like 140 over 95, and, you know, the doctor prescribed blood pressure medicine. Oh, it was like, whoa, it changed my life. And I'm still on it, very low dose, five milligrams a day. And my blood pressure is great and has been for years. But so I try to use that, probably a bad analogy. But, you know, sometimes when you're in a bad, not a healthy situation, it feels okay because there's enough good around you. But, boy, when it hits, you know, you know, why didn't I see the warning sign? Why didn't I pay attention? I've heard church people say this. I've heard husbands and wives say this. You know, I've heard families talk about this thing. And it's sort of a, you know, we need to pay attention to the warning signs before we get to the boiling point. As they say, a watch pot never boils. I love it. That's that's good stuff. So we're, we're quickly running out of time. I'm going to ask you if you're okay uh, with me asking you one more question, and then we'll, we'll, we'll end with our ending question. Um, uh, and we're not going to have time to dive into deep into chapter six, but I do want to pull, pull one thing out of it. And that is the title Christlike leaders practice self care. And just out of curiosity, because, uh, I, I realize, you know, as I, as I started this interview, you, you have been, um, relationally, you are just an amazing leader. You've, you've, uh, you've connected with so many people you've been a, a, at the same time have been a great father and a great husband. And I, I know that that comes with good self-care. You don't, you don't have bad self-care and still be highly relational and, and impacting and not push people away from you. So just a, just a question out of curiosity, has there been times in your leadership tenure that, that uh, you haven't had good self-care and what does that look like for you? So again, uh, thank God for my wife, Marlene. I call her the queen. Um, she's been my self-care barometer. She, you know, backs me off, backs me down, backs me out. <laughs> you know, honey, you better, you better slow down. Um, your children need you. Um, we've always tried to take Monday as a day off, sort of a recovery day. And... Uh, when I was evangelist, I lived for Mondays because those days was revival Tuesday through Sunday, twice on Sunday. So that sort of became my pattern, my habit. Protect Mondays like Fort Knox. I haven't always done a good job of that, especially with the advent of the iPhone. Phones are a blessing and a curse. You know, 2,500 text messages a month. That's a little. That's a little much. That's uh, a lot. Yeah. And uh, so I think in the book, you know, I argue for the spirit of the Sabbath. And I think we've not done a good job of that. You know, I've heard national leaders when I was a young 20-something preacher brag about never taking vacations. Uh, I'm like, what? Yeah. Huh? That's dumb. I mean, a 25-year-old <laughs> pastor saw through that. Never take a vacation. So I argue for the spirit of the Sabbath. You know, we think that if you go on a sabbatical, that you're backslid. You know, there's something wrong with your marriage, your ministry. You got deep, dark sin in your life. Oh, he took a sabbatical. Oh, my God. Because, you know, rest is not spiritual in the UPCI. So I applaud our general superintendent, David Bernard, for leading the way and taking a sabbatical. I want him to. He should. And he's yeah. leading the way. I mean, if you knew what I know about what he deals with and is confronted and handled, he's got to have, you know, four weeks of no interruptions and recovery and renewal. And then when he comes out of it, he's back at it. So a sabbatic, the spirit of the Sabbath is rest. Yeah. And it doesn't mean you have to go away. You have to spend money. You can take a two hour sabbatical in a stressful day. Just turn the lights out, shut it down, you know, kick your chair back in your That's office, good. take a nap, you know, divert. So in the book, I think we say divert daily, 
withdraw weekly, quarantine quarterly, abandon annually. I got that from T.F. Tenney. I don't know where he got it, but I loved it. And this is a systematic way to honor the spirit of the Sabbath. And the spirit of the Sabbath is rest, recovery. Yeah. Israel refused. There is no record they ever observed the sabbatical year. Every seventh year, let the land rest. No, they had to keep growing. They had to keep making money. They had to keep planting. And so God sent them into Babylon for 70 years because they ignored 70 sabbaticals. Mm. So if you don't if you don't observe the Sabbath, life will take it out of you, and yeah. it's usually not good. Would you consider um, play, as in golf or hunting or you know whatever the ladies may do uh, for fun? Would you consider fun as as a part of that self care? Yeah, well? it's a piece of it. It is a piece of it. Self care, yeah. you know. We're in the ministry. Enjoying good, relationships with Yeah, with all of people. that. Family. Yeah. yeah. I think as leaders, our strength is that uh, we care and we serve and we give to others. That's also mm-hmm. our weakness because we're usually not good receivers. We don't know how to receive. Moses, yeah. you know, was leading and giving and serving the people all day long. But thank God he allowed Aaron and her to climb the mountain with him, and he received their ministry. So we need to be good givers and good receivers. That's very good, really good. So let's end with a question that I that I try to end all of these podcasts with, and it doesn't have to be related to the book or, or to our topics. But uh, what's one thing that you wish you could tell your younger self looking back? A lot of things. Um, I think I would have to say be more intentional and savor. So don't, yeah, don't think that success is a destination, Hmm. but it's a journey. That's you know, I just read good. a headline this week. A Super Bowl winner of a few years ago took his own life. You know, in the sports world, it's like, oh, you win the Super Bowl. You know, for the world, them guy, that guy will never have to buy another beer as long as he lives, right? If he's in the town where he won the Super Bowl. And I forgive yeah. the carnal analogy. But <laughs> it's like, it's like, oh, my God. That, that should be the ultimate. Yeah. Speaking of Super Bowl, I heard Matt Burke. Uh, who won a Super Bowl with the Baltimore Ravens, they uh, they said, uh, uh, boy, that must have been great to win the Super Bowl. He said, yeah, but it wasn't the greatest thing. The reporter said, oh, what was the greatest thing? He said, it was the journey. Hmm. It was the battle, the struggle, you know, the growth, the development through the season with my my, my colleagues. We go to battle together and and we practice together and we loved each other and we – and it was just the journey. And so I think I wished I would have learned earlier on in my life that success is not how many are in church, you know, how many were there, you know, uh, who do you know, you know, but but take the journey. It's God is not near as in, impressed with big churches as he is with big people. And. You know, make sure that you're stopping to smell the roses and you're building the relationships and you realize that success is not a destination, but it's a process. And let me just say this last thing, Ryan. I had a life-changing moment at the deathbed of my father. My father was the greatest Christian I ever knew. And I, I looked around the room. There was my brother, my two sisters, my mother. So the six of us, and Dad's in the middle on a bed. He's wasting away, cancer, five years. And I took in that moment, and I thought, man, no axes to grind, no hatchets to bury. All the relationships are up to date. I want this. Married to the same woman for, I think, Dad and Mom were married 56 years. I said to myself, Mm -hmm. I'm going to have this. That's success. 
Success in life is having the people closest to you love and respect you the most. If you don't have that, you're not a success. I don't care how big your church is. I don't care what car you drive. So good. I don't care where you buy your suits or what name brands on your shoes. You're not successful unless the people closest to you love and respect you the most. That's so good. Slow down. Enjoy the process. Enjoy the moment. Don't don't look for the next position or the next achievement, but enjoy today. Enjoy enjoy sitting here with an amazing man, Brother Gleason, and and having this conversation. Um, enjoying enjoying the process of 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 moving through life and 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 ministry. Well, Brother Gleason, this has been a, an amazing interview. And I just want to thank you again for being willing to give your valuable time for the conversation today. It's been such a pleasure to have you on. And Brother Gleason, can you tell people uh, where they can purchase your book, The Unflawed Leader, if they would like to? Sure. It's available at Amazon and also Barnes & Noble. And before I also sign off, Ryan, let me say how much I admire and appreciate you, um, the good work that you're doing. I love the name of your podcast. And it just embodies who you are. And you're such a good communicator. And uh, I think the mark of a good communicator is they can take complicated things and make them simple. And that's who you are and what you're doing. You're making a difference. So I thank God for you. And I've enjoyed our time together. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you so much. And I want to encourage every listener to go on Amazon or wherever you purchase books and get that book, The Unflawed Leader. It is a phenomenal book. You can use it for a small group in a small group setting uh, as you develop leaders or, or uh, actually there's tons of different ways you can you can use that book, but it is phenomenal nuggets, much, much more than what we were able to cover today. So be sure to get that. And also I would encourage you to subscribe wherever you listen to podcast or on YouTube. And also it would make my day if you would just take a few minutes to rate the show and write a review my name is Ryan Franklin. Thank you so much for listening to the Christian Leader Made Simple podcast. God bless.